Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second segment of our cells unit notes. Uh, this is going to cover cell membranes and the movement of materials across the membrane. But before we get into that, it's it would be really important for us to recognize how we learn some of this uh, information about all these organelles. Uh, I want to share with you a, uh, a picture that uh, just includes a bunch of cheek cells. These cells right here are cheek cells that have been scraped from the inside of a cheek, uh, smeared onto a slide, a cover slip was put on them, and they viewed them under a microscope. Well, hey, I know you can see the little waves and dots and stuff in there, but you don't see the kind of detail that you'd really like to see. And so what scientists do is they use stains and indicators to show the presence of different materials. All right, now there are a whole bunch that I'm going to share with you today. Some we are going to use and some we aren't going to use. One of them, uh, one of them is silver nitrate. And silver nitrate, if I click over here, this is silver nitrate. And silver nitrate is a great indicator for the presence of salts. It will change color when it's around salts in a solution. It'll actually form this white precipitate. The solid will just kind of clump up at the bottom. Another indicator that we use, and I'm going to use uh, today a little bit, is methylene blue. Methylene blue is a really deep kind of royal blue color. Um, and if I actually, uh, if I go like this, I can probably show you how bright blue it is that I'm talking about. If I had any in there, how about that? I just don't want to make a mess. All right. If I take a little piece of paper towel and blot this away, you'll see how bright blue it is. All right, so it's a really nice blue color, and it makes cells really easy to see because it will bind to cellular DNA. And I can show you that in this uh, picture right here. So here are those regular cheek cells. There are cheek cells that have been stained with methylene blue the nucleus becomes really, really visible, and it will even bind to uh, some of the organelles like ribosomes and such that give the, the rest of the protein within the, uh, or the genetic material within the cell, uh, because RNA is also genetic material, it'll stain that as well. So you've got little bacteria which have DNA, those get stained. So you can see all of those with the use of methylene blue. That's not the only stain that we use. We also use another stain, and this stain is also a really good indicator. And now there's two different terms there, a stain and an indicator. Now, this is cheek cells that have been stained with iodine. And iodine has a tendency to bind to uh, complex carbohydrates. But I'm going to take a second and I'm going to show you that uh, this is what iodine looks like normally. It's got that amber color. And we use iodine. This is called Lugol's iodine. We use it as an indicator for the presence of complex carbohydrates like starch. Now, what I have here is a Petri dish with a, a starch and water mixture. And if you mix iodine with starch, you'll see that there is a very obvious color change. And that color change is how indicators work. Indicators will bind to and visually show the presence of a substance. So iodine, which starts out this amber color, will change to this blue color in the presence of starch. That's going to be important in our lab coming up because I have another uh, indicator here, Benedict's solution. Benedict's solution is this really nice blue color, but when you combine Benedict's solution with simple carbohydrates like glucose, it actually uh, changes to a brick red color. All right, so before I get too far, I want to show you also how we can manipulate some of these stains 
on a slide. So let's say we're looking at um, some sl some uh, cells that have been stained on a slide. And in order to show how I can manipulate this, I'm going to use some of this dark stain. I'm going to lower that uh, cover slip at an angle so that I don't have any air bubbles. All right. Now, let's say that this is a salt solution underneath here or even a stain solution. All right. If I want to get all that extra stain out, I need to have a strategy. And that's exactly what you need to know now. All right. So that's this part right here. I'm all I need is a simple paper towel. All right. It really helps if I use the jagged end instead of these uh, finished edges. They tend to be a little more absorbent. And I'm going to take some plain old water. All right. This is just a dropper with water. And what I can do is I can put the edge of my paper towel here and it's going to start to absorb that stain. But I'm also going to put some water over here and I'm going to let that just diffuse. Now, there's a term you're going to hear as uh, as we go through our, our notes today because you'll see that I can absorb all that water uh, and it's going to pull the stain right along with it. And I can replace whatever's underneath and I never have to take my slide apart. So I can do that again if I've got a little extra that I want to get rid of. All right, I can put some more water there. And again, just putting the edge of my paper towel right up to the edge of that. Oh, and there, there it goes. I can see all the blue getting sucked right out from underneath it. All I need to do is have that paper towel there and it'll pull it through. Now I can return it if I want to get stained back under there or maybe I want a salt solution underneath there. I can take my solution and I can put it along the edge there. All I need to do is have it there at the edge and I can use my paper towel to pull the water through and lo and behold my stain gets dragged under there too so I can clear out anything that was underneath there and exchange the solution underneath the slide or underneath the cover slip and I can use my paper towel to clean up my space and then I can put that right on my microscope and view my stained cells. All right, so that's a great strategy to know about. And now what I'm going to do, because I'm going to I'm going to show you how that gets used. If I can get this stuff out of the way. See, so here we are back to our uh, our slide or our cells. And it's important to understand that cells can manipulate what can get in and what can't get in uh, to a cell. And, we know that it's the cell membrane that controls that. It's made up of a phospholipid bilayer with two layers of lipids and large proteins embedded in it that can shuttle materials through. Uh, this idea of a moving membrane is called the fluid mosaic model. The phospholipid design creates a barrier which allows the membrane to separate the internal environment from the external or outside environment. It is selectively permeable. So it's gonna have uh, receptors and proteins and um, all sorts of connecting molecules. These are carbohydrate chains that uh, stick to the cell membrane or their protein uh, passages through the cell membrane. We can see those down here. All right, some materials can pass right through and the materials that can pass right through include things like water can pass right through, carbon dioxide, oxygen, um, even elements like iodine, we mentioned iodine earlier, it can pass right through that cell membrane. But there are some things that cannot if it's a charged particle, all right? 
like uh, ions have a hard time getting through the cell membrane. So they have to have a membrane protein or ion channel there. All right. Uh, also, large molecules like proteins and sugars, uh, they're large. They're big molecules, so they can't fit right through. They've got to have something to shuttle them through. Or if it's a protein like that you're eating, you've got to break it down into its building blocks. So a protein has to be broken down into amino acids. And a large carbohydrate like starch has to be broken down into simple sugars. It's just never really going to fit. It's just so big. All right. So different molecules are allowed to pass through. Small molecules tend to be able to, and large molecules have to be digested first. All right, so let's talk about the next slide on here. Uh, diffusion. I mentioned diffusion just a moment or two ago. All right, so uh, passive and active transport are two ways that materials can be moved in or out of a cell. We're going to start with passive. The word passive means without energy, so no ATP is needed. The first one on our list is diffusion. It is the movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. In other words, from where there's a lot stuffed in a tight space to where there's very little. A great example of this is like a fart in a car. All right, someone farts in a car, it starts concentrated around the person who dealt it. Well, it's going to slowly diffuse from where there's a lot right behind them to where there's very little around everybody else. All right. It moves by what's called a concentration gradient. The molecules bump into each other and they end up slowly bumping farther and farther away until you reach what's known as dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is met when particles continue to move around the car or around the cell or in the solution, but they're moving equally and there's no overall change in the concentration. It stays the same. All right, so that's diffusion. Movement of materials from where there's a lot to where there's a little. Diffusion is the uh, backbone of letter B, osmosis, the diffusion of water. Osmosis is just talking about movement of water to create balance or equal solutions. There are three important solutions that you need to know about. The first is an isotonic solution. Isotonic solutions are concentrations of dissolved substances inside and outside of the cell that are even. So the amount of dissolved salt outside the cell is equal to the amount of salt inside of the cell. There's no overall change or movement of water across that membrane. Does water move? You bet it does. It can cross the membrane. But when two water molecules move in, somewhere else two water molecules are slowly cruising out. All right, so it's even movement, that's isotonic. The second solution here is hypertonic. And hypertonic is a little more complicated. It is the concentration of substances where the water or solution around the cells have a higher amount of dissolved salts. So it's a really salty environment. Think going into the ocean. When you go swimming in the ocean, if you've ever been there, spent much time in the ocean, when you come out, your skin gets dried out, all right? Water is leaving the cells of your body to try and create balance with the solution around it. And here's a picture that kind of shows that. The red line indicates the cell membrane. Inside of the cell is a 10% salt solution. Outside is 20% salt. That's more salt outside than inside. Well, salt can't cross the membrane, so water does. And water moves slowly and uh, uh, very, uh, I, I would say, easily through the cell membrane. And as water leaves, this salt solution or concentration of 10% is going to slowly creep up because less water is in there. It's going to go to 11, then 12, and then 13. 
and it's going to keep going up until the outside and the inside are equal. That is when it reaches dynamic equilibrium. All right, so nature likes balance, and it's going to keep diffusing until it meets its dynamic equilibrium or balance. Let's look at the next slide because that's going to show us uh, what happens to a cell when it's put into a salty solution. This is called plasmolysis. It is the shrinking of a cell as a result of water leaving. There are a lot of different examples of this, but plants will wilt when this happens. And I happen to have some pictures on my slide earlier that show this. Here is a picture of an Elodea cell. Uh, these are you can these are uh, plant cells. You can see all the green chloroplasts, and all the organelles are stuffed around the outside, and the center is filled with water. There's a large central vacuole. And uh, if you put this into a hypertonic solution, it's going to lose water. And what you're going to end up with is this. The cell wall stays behind. It's rigid. But the cell membrane, which is located around all those chloroplasts, that central water vacuole has shrunk significantly. It's lost water to the environment because of osmosis. Right, this is what happens in a hypertonic solution. I have another example of this here. These are red onion cells. This red onion is filled with red pigment and it's got a large central vacuole that's filled with water. But if you put salt around this, Water is going to diffuse out, but the pigment is too big to fit through the cell membrane, so it gets concentrated tighter and tighter into these shrinking vacuoles. So the central vacuole shrinks, and it loses its water. The cell wall stays behind. All right. Now, you might ask the question, well, what happens to a cell if it's an animal cell? And that's a great question. All right, this particular picture shows what will happen. All right, in a hypertonic, hyper meaning uh, lots of salt, cells will shrink. Here's, an an, uh, here's a plant cell shown shrinking. This is the starting red blood cell. This is a red blood cell in your body. If you put it into a salty solution, hypertonic, lots of salt around this. It's going to cause water from the cell to leave and it's going to shrink. Now, the middle one is an isotonic solution. As water molecules diffuse in, water also leaves. All right. And it's balanced. It's in dynamic equilibrium. This third scenario is a hypotonic solution, and that's actually our third and final uh, scenario here. I'm going to move this out of the way for a moment, and I'll show you this. All right, a hypotonic, the prefix hypo means low or below. All right, a hypotonic solution is when the solution has low amounts of salt. And actually, this diagram has the wrong numbers on it. So I made a, a little uh, text box that I could throw in here to make it correct. All right, so inside of, this, in, inside of the uh, cell is low salt, and outside of the cell is very, oops, whoopsie daisy, I just did it backwards. How about that? That's very helpful. Okay, so I just corrected that because I was rushing. All right, so inside of the cell has a high salt concentration. Outside is low. Hypo means low. All right, low amounts of dissolved salts. Well, in this scenario, because there's less water inside of the cell and more salt, water's going to diffuse in by osmosis and that's going to cause the cell to swell and what will happen is as more and more water enters this cell the 20 percent salt solution is going to become 19 
and then it's going to become 18 and the cell is going to gradually expand and expand to fit all that extra water in an animal cell there's no cell wall so as that number drops and more and more water enters it eventually bursts and that's what you see in this final picture right here the red blood cell actually ruptures and splits open and dies uh, too much water can actually be very dangerous and uh, can kill you okay so now let's get to our next one here uh, that brings me to active transport what if it can't just flow through like water does what if it needs a little help all right so active transport requires the expenditure of energy and this is the movement of materials from uh, from low concentration to high concentration is a great example all right if i have uh, the need to move material through a membrane with the use of a uh, protein to push them all to one side then I've got to use some energy in that process. Active transport typically goes from where there's a little to where there's a lot. So you're pumping it all to one side. And that's what these images are showing. If I want to, your nerves work this way, all right? This is how uh, your nerves work. This is how uh, different chemicals affect your, your body, all right? Now, these are small molecules that can be moved in, in charged particles that are moved like this. But in letter A, we're going to talk about what if they're big molecules. Endocytosis is a process of moving large molecules into endo, meaning enter, all right? entering the cytoplasm. So you've got that root there. Endo means in or enter, cyto meaning the cytoplasm. So endocytosis is when a cell membrane actually can engulf. It forms this a divot inside of it. So this little in, impression here will take in materials and form a vacuole. All right. Now this is how food vacuoles can be made. Uh, your white blood cells in your body will grab bacteria this way and engulf them we call that phagocytosis phagocytosis is for food phago food all right so phagocytosis is taking in solid particles and then the second type of endocytosis is pinocytosis or pino now uh, that's water only that's liquid all right, so phago is food, pino is water. And then lastly is exocytosis. Exocytosis is the movement of materials in large quantities again. It's the exact opposite though of endo. And in this case, you're gonna have mass movement of large molecules out of the cell. Exocytosis means exit. All right, so we're exiting the cytoplasm. So if I enlarge this image here, what you'll see is that your cells, this is what happens in hormone production. This is how your nerves work when they release uh, nerve transmitters or neurotransmitters or hormone release. All those hormones were packaged in the Golgi. All right, I'm gonna give you a second to process that. The Golgi bodies package all the materials. If you want them to leave the cell, the vacuole moves towards the cell membrane, the cell membrane fuses, and it just, fly, it just flies open like that. It just splits the cell, and that vacuole becomes part of the cell membrane. All the pieces that were inside of it are dumped out. Now, there are different reasons that a cell might do this, though. A cell would do this for uh, getting rid of wastes, and a cell would do this for uh, releasing hormones. All right. That's shown right here, hormone and enzyme secretion. All right. But these all require energy. And I am going to show you one last one 
before I finish up, and that's this right here. This is a single-celled paramecium, and it has a special type of vacuole called a contractile vacuole. This is another one of those, this takes energy type of job. And if you look closely at the contractile vacuole shown right here, the paramecium, in order to deal with water diffusing into its body by osmosis, so it doesn't pop, it pumps all that water into this contractile vacuole found at the front and at the back. And what it will do is it'll pump it all in there and then really quickly squeeze all the water out through these tiny little vessels, all right, out to the outside of the cell. That's called a contractile vacuole. And you can see those little uh, vessels that are pathways for the water to be eliminated. All right. That is a contractile vacuole, a specialized type of vacuole that are found in single-celled organisms like a paramecium. These are protozoa. Okay, so these are some of the great things that we know about how membranes and materials can be moved through your body or through the cell. Okay, it's important that you recognize that we covered uh, stains, and indicators. We covered how to change the solution underneath your slides, under your cover slips, and then we talked about the movement of water across a membrane by diffusion and osmosis. All right. Okay. Hey, listen, have a great day, and I hope, uh, I hope if you have any questions, you'll contact either myself or Mrs. Saunders.